Our sermon is entitled today, What Jesus' Resurrection Accomplished. Please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Today we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 16. So this morning, for a few moments, I want us to concentrate on what the Apostle Paul says ought to be the result of Christ's resurrection power at work in us. Now you'll remember that at the end of Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 19, Paul had said there's this incredible power at work in us. He said it was the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly places. So Paul identifies that power as the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And we've seen Paul saying in Ephesians 4 that the power of the resurrection and now the power of the ascended Christ that is at work on behalf of His church and that ascended Lord Jesus at the right hand of God the Father is pouring out gifts on the church. So that in Ephesians 4 verses 14 through 16, Paul's explaining to us the purpose of the resurrection power of Jesus, the purpose of the ascended Christ in gifting the church, and that there are to be results for us. There's to be a consequence in us of the resurrected Christ actualized in us, in power and His reigning in the way that we live. There's to be a practical result of Jesus' resurrection and ascension and present rule in our lives. And that's what we're going to concentrate on this morning in verses 14 through 16. So we're going to look at the results of the resurrection or put it a different way because there are many ways we can think of the results. We can think of the results of the resurrection as things which Jesus' resurrection actually accomplished. And you'll see a list of those things which Jesus' resurrection accomplished. But here we're thinking about the consequences of Jesus' resurrection power in us. Consequences of the ascended Jesus who's pouring out gifts on His church. So what is that power supposed to produce? What are the gifts that the ascended Christ pours out on the church supposed to produce? What does the resurrection power of Jesus look like when it is flowing in us? That's what we're going to concentrate on today. Before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for His help. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. It is the Word of truth. And we thank You that the Lord Jesus is risen and risen indeed. And we thank You that we believe that. And it's more real to us even the, than the fact that we're sitting in our chairs right now. Well, there are so many things in this world that cause us to struggle and doubt, uh, Lord, we, we still know that Your truth will be manifest in our hearts and in our lives. And we ask that Holy Spirit would come today and do just that. Uh, help us to understand this text and then apply it to us as only you can. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our verses today is Ephesians 4, verses 14 through 16, but I'm going to be, start reading in verse 11 for the sake of context. This is God's Word. And He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, till we all attain to the unity of, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Amen. And may God write the eternal truths of His Word upon all of our hearts. Jesus Christ is alive. He has resurrected. He has ascended. And He is ruling his, this world by His Word and Spirit. He's pouring out gifts upon His church. So what? For what reason is Christ's resurrection power at work in us? This is a marvelous thought, and it's worthy of reflection, isn't it? That Christ's resurrection power is at work in you and me. But we've already studied that in Ephesians 1. So this passage is, in this passage, the question is being answered for us. For what reason is the ascended and, and Christ and pouring out His gifts on the church? What the, what's the result of the resurrection power and His in gifting the church? What's the result of that in us? That's what Paul wants us to consider in this passage. So I'd like for us to see three things here in verses 14, 15, and 16. And, and I do want us to notice that the three things that Paul tells us are the results 
from the resurrection power of Jesus at work, as well as the engifting of the ascended Christ to His church. These things are spoken about more than once in this passage. For instance, in verse 14, you'll see Paul speaking about our being established in the truth. But he does it in a negative way. He gives an illustration of what happens to people who are not established in the truth. And then in verse 15, he will speak of the, positively of the importance of our being established in the truth. And then in verse 15, when he speaks about our being matured or our growing in love, he'll speak of that also in verse 16. And then in verse 16, when he speaks about our being matured as a body, matured as a community, well, he has already started speaking about that in verse 15. So the truth is, we're going to see in verses 14, 15, and 16, it's really these, these concepts, these themes, these, these images are mixed and repeated throughout the passage. I want us to see three things in particular the Apostle says are to, are to result in us because of this resurrection power and because of the ascended and ruling Christ is pouring out gifts on His church. And the first one is this, that we are to be established in the truth. Christ's resurrection power at work in us is to root us in truth, is to establish us in truth. And His ascended rule in which He engifts the church is designed to root us and establish us in truth. And so consequently, Paul will state this negatively in verse 14, that as a result of the ascended Christ and of the engifting of the church, and as a result of His resurrection power, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men, by craftiness of, ske of, of deceitful scheming. And notice in this passage, as Paul gives a negative example of people who are not rooted in the truth, that in the space of one verse, he manages to give us four different metaphors or images of this. So he starts off with children. Now, children are often used as a positive example, a positive picture of membership in the kingdom of God. But children by nature lack maturity. And so when he says we're no longer to be children, what he is speaking of is we must not be immature in our discernment. So what's one of the, a parent's greatest fears? Well, that your child at some point of immaturity and discernment will be taken advantage of by an adult who has evil purposes. A person who takes advantage of their trusting nature and their lack of discernment so that they may do them harm in some way. Every parent fears that. And sometimes that fear it, it lasts long after they are toddlers. The Apostle Paul is saying the same thing about the church. He says, I don't want you to be immature in your discernment so that you can be taken advantage of by those who deny the truth, who are seeking to make you an object as a means for their purposes. Then he quickly changes the image and he says, we're not to be tossed here and there by, by the waves. The picture is of a, of a waved tossed passenger on a ship or a boat. Now picture in your mind for a moment. Anyone ever been out in, in the water in a small boat when the water's rough? Well, you're at the mercy of the waves to some extent. And you can turn the boat into the waves and that'll help a little bit, but you're really just being tossed about. And you probably should try to get back to shore, otherwise your boat eventually may capsize. The Apostle is saying that tossing about is the picture of what happens to someone who is not rooted and established in truth. He says, I want you to be grounded. So you cannot be tossed about by the waves. And then he changes the picture again, and he speaks of being carried about by every wind of doctrine. And the picture is of straw or leaves or paper or something being blown around in the wind. I know most of us have probably dropped a piece of paper on a windy day, and you've tried to chase it and get it back. Uh, you, you need that sheet of paper. It's important to you. Maybe you're in the parking lot on a windy day and you either have your grocery list or there's this important document and you're getting ready to head into some office and take care of some business. You're fumbling around with your keys or trying to close your car door. You lose your grip on the paper and, and it just starts blowing all over the parking lot. And you're dodging cars. You're even uh, trying to step on that paper just to get it to stop blowing so you can get your, your hands back on it again. The Apostle Paul is saying that is a picture of a person who is not rooted and established in truth. They're just blown around from here to there. And then he switches the picture again. He says, not deceived by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. In other words, he doesn't want us to be easily deceived by false teachers 
And that's so important because false teachers have always been around. They were around in the first and second centuries and every century in between. They're around today. And, and Jesus and Paul and the other apostles all taught us that we would face the challenges of false teachers. We always will. And that's one reason why being established in the truth is so important. Now, some of you have heard about discovery of a document that took, took place a number of years ago. It was the, the Gospel of Judas. Now, this document was discovered in 1978 by a farmer. It was found in a cave in central Egypt. The copy that they found, though, was written in Coptic, and most scholars believe that, the, of course, the original manuscript was written in Greek from around the middle of the second century. This document wasn't translated into English until 2006, but this document talks about Jesus and Judas Iscariot. Now, I'll, I'll begin by saying, if you've, if you've read the Bible, then you can easily realize by the time you've read about two paragraphs of the Gospel of Judas that this is a false and a spurious gospel, which is why it's not part of Scripture. But it gives a radically different picture of Jesus and Judas from the one we, we've always had. This gospel of Judas is, in fact, implies that Judas was the only disciple that really understood Jesus' mission and purpose. And it says that Jesus had asked Judas to betray him in order that he could be freed from his body and that Judas hung himself in order to free himself from his earthly body and to release, be released into the world of spirits. So this Gospel of Judas radically retells the historical Gospel's perspective on Jesus and on His mission. And as you would imagine, some scholars get all excited about that. Well, dear friends, I want you to understand there's absolutely nothing new in the Gospel of Judas. I've read it. It's just the same old Gnostic heresy that's been around for 2,000 years, and it's no wonder that people make over it. Uh, the very people who would like to foster a modern paganism, a modern Gnosticism in the church, are the same people that are so excited about the Gospel of Judas. Well, let me tell you three things about the Gospel of Judas. The first thing is, if you just open your, open your Bibles this afternoon, you know, take, take a few minutes and just skim through the Gospels. Turn to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just look through these Gospels. Let your eyes fall upon those words. Now, let me tell you something. When you do that, when you just look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will have looked at four historical documents that are more than a century and a half older than the Gospel of Judas. The author of the Gospel of Judas did not know Jesus or Judas or anybody who knew the historical Jesus and Judas. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all knew Jesus. They were eyewitnesses to his life, his ministry, his death, burial, and resurrection. Three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were certainly written within 30 years of Jesus' death and resurrection. The Gospel of John, perhaps within 40 to 50 years of Jesus' death and resurrection. But they were all written by apostles or eyewitnesses of the Lord Jesus and of his original mission and his message. And when these Gospels were written, the people who had, had access to these Gospels were people who were still alive during Jesus' ministry and who could have easily corroborated or refuted their content if it didn't happen, just as the Gospel said. Whereas the Gospel of Judas is some, from somewhere late in the second century by someone who had no idea of the original mission and message of Jesus. Well, the second thing I want to tell you is this. The discovery of the Gospel of Judas did not tell us anything new whatsoever. Because we have known about the Gospel of Judas for over 1,800 years. Do you know that the early church pastor and theologian Irenaeus, the man who wrote Against Heresies, well, he has a section in that, in, in the, in that book in where he critiques the Gospel of Judas. He knew about it. Irenaeus, yes, that Irenaeus who knew Polycarp and had heard Polycarp's preaching. You know, Polycarp was the last known living connection with the apostles. Polycarp had studied under the apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, the disciple who leaned on Jesus at the Last Supper, who, 
had a special relationship with him, part of the inner circle of three. So Irenaeus, who knew Polycarp and sat under his preaching and who had studied under John, he knew about the gospel of Judas. And he knew that it was a Gnostic heretical forgery. Thirdly, Irenaeus actually tells us what group wrote it. He says it's a group called the Cainites. Now think about that name, the Cainites. They were Gnostics who went to every bad figure in the Bible, beginning with Cain, and they attempted to rehabilitate them. Now can you imagine going to a historical account of Cain and Abel and making Cain the hero of the story? Well, that's what these Gnostics did. And interestingly, liberal scholars have been telling us for years and years that if we ever were to discover these documents that the early church fathers criticized, we would find out that the early church fathers had terribly misrepresented them in an attempt to suppress them in their originality and their creativity. Well, guess what? When we obtained a copy of the Gospel of Judas, it shows that Irenaeus knew exactly what he was talking about and that his criticisms were dead right. You see, dear friends, people have been making up false stories like this from the very beginning to lead Christians astray. And the apostle is saying this is one reason why it's so important to be established in the truth. And why, that is why we emphasize the truth. I mean, right doctrine and everything we do. All believers ought to glory in the truth of Scripture, glory in the words of Scripture. The Christian ought to glory in the authoritative teaching of Scripture and in right doctrine. That is one of the consequences of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ at work in us. John Calvin once said that Satan can never rest without striving to darken by his lies the pure doctrine of Christ. And God wants to strengthen us as he tests our faith with those struggles. So when false teachers come, although they're trying to darken the truth of God by their lies, God's wanting to test us to assure that we're established in the truth. That's one of the re results of the resurrection power of Jesus at work in us. We are to be rooted in the truth, established in the truth, so that we're not blown around by every false teaching and wind of doctrine. But there's a second thing. Because we're not only to be established in the truth, we're to be growing in love. So point two on our outline this morning, we are to grow in love. Notice how Paul puts it in verse 15. But speaking the truth in love. And again in verse 16, that the Lord Jesus causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. How does the church grow in maturity? The apostle tells us it, is, it grows by truth and love. Whenever you hear somebody pitting uh, truth against love or, or love against truth, you can best believe that they do not understand the Bible's teaching about truth and love. Because truth and love are not opponents. They are comrades in the great work of Christian maturity. And that's why when you hear the criticism, oh, that person, they're just too concerned about the truth. Well, their criticism is misguided, and at, at, at least in, in, in the analysis. Is it possible for a person to understand, to, uh, to misunderstand the function of truth? Well, yes, it is. Is it possible for a person to misunderstand the goal of truth? Yes, it is. Is it possible for a person to be too concerned about the truth? No, it is not. Of course, it is true that sometimes people seem to care a great deal about the truth, but they don't understand what the truth is for. So they don't love people well when they tell them the truth. They're, they're not very good at soul care. They don't understand the function of truth. And it is true that sometimes people show a great deal of concern about the truth and they still don't know the real goal of truth. The apostle explains to us here that the function of truth is the fostering of real Christian love. And that the goal of truth is the expression of real Christian love. And so we stress that the, the practice of truth is always in the context of love. It always aims for love. And, and of course, love doesn't mean just being nice. I mean, that's what love has been reduced to in our own culture. You know, just be nice, don't, don't speak the truth to anyone. But you can accept someone, I didn't say condone their sin, but you can accept someone right where they are and still tell them the truth. It takes humility 
It takes an awareness of one's own personal brokenness. But people seem to think that speaking truth cannot be loving. And yet even pagans, even secular people in our culture understand that there's something called tough love. Tough love is loving someone enough to do something that's not very pleasant for you or for them. And that requires truth. It requires more than just niceness. It requires a genuine concern for the well-being of another person, even though it costs you something. That's real biblical love. That kind of love, that strong love, heroic love, self-sacrificial love, loving someone through their struggles, not cutting them off, just washing your hands of them. That's what the resurrection power of Jesus is, to, is supposed to produce in us. And that's why Jesus came. That's why he was crucified. That's why he rose from the dead with all authority. And he promised to be with us to the end of the age uh, to create a people whose sins are forgiven and whose hearts are so full of God's love. And they're so emboldened by the triumphant Christ that they speak, they spend their lives, they speak out, they spend their lives also with risk, sacrifice and love to help others know and enjoy the greatness of Christ forever and ever. Is this not that for which we were made? And, there's, is, and, and is there not something in your own soul that witnesses to you that this is true and it's worthy of full acceptance? And the apostle says, that is the result of the power of Christ at work in you. You love the truth, you're established in the truth, and you're also emboldened toward heroic self-sacrificial love. It, it may be in the context of your marriage or your family. It might be in the context of your vocation. It may be in the context of a loss that you've just experienced. But in a thousand different ways, you manifest that bold, heroic Christian love because the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus is at work in you. But there's one more thing I want you to see this morning, very briefly. It's in verse 16. Here the Apostle tells us that we are not only established in the truth because of Christ's resurrection power and His ascended gifting of the church, we're not only growing in love because of His work in our lives, but we are maturing as a community of faith. So point three then, we are to mature as a community of faith. Notice how he puts it, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building of, up of itself in love. You understand the emphasis here that the maturity and the growth that each of us experiences because of the resurrection power of Christ and because of His ascension and His engifting of the church because of the work of the Holy Spirit, that the growth and maturity that each one of us experiences is not simply for ourselves. It's for the whole body. So that my personal growth is not my first agenda when I come to church. But the well-being of the whole body, that's my first agenda, even in my personal growth. And again, I don't think it can be put any plainer than how Calvin puts it when he says, this means, and he's speaking of this verse here, this means that no increase is of use which does not correspond to the whole body. That man is mistaken who desires his own separate growth. In other words, he says, as we come under the word, as we come under the means of grace, as we pray for the resurrection power of Jesus to be displayed in us, as we pray to grow in grace and become more Christ-like, our ultimate concern cannot simply be for our own personal growth, but in fact for the well-being of the whole body. So it is, Lord, grow me in grace for the benefit of the whole body. Because you have empowered me, not so I can just be uh, more well off or I'll have it easier or I'll be more successful. You've empowered me in order to be a blessing to the whole body. Lord, you have risen and ascended and poured out your gifts on the church and on me, not so that I can bless myself, but so that I can bless others. Lord, everything that you've given me and everything you've done in me, in my life, and through me, is so that I would turn from looking toward myself and I would give myself away. I would look outward, give myself away in self-sacrificial, self-denying, self-giving love. And Paul's saying that is to be the consequence of the resurrection power of Christ at work in us. The consequence of Jesus, the ascended ruling Christ, 
And His in gifting the church that we are rooted in love and that we tenaciously hold to the truth and we love the truth, we know the truth, we understand it, and we dwell on the truth. And we're committed to growing in love so that our lives are characterized by self-giving, self-sacrificing love of Christ for His people in all that we do. And that our own personal growth itself is ultimately designed not, not, only, not only for His own glory, though it is, but also for the well-being of one another. What a dramatic adventure the resurrection power of Jesus in His ascended rule is meant to be manifested in our lives. It all goes back to the beginning of this chapter, doesn't it? Paul said, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Basically, we're to walk in line with the truth of the gospel. And that means a life of repentance and faith. He, he's not, Jesus is our only source of righteousness. And God has promised that He will sanctify us by His grace as we look to Him. So let's go to Him. Our Lord and our God, we thank You for the truth of the resurrection. We pray that Your purposes for the resurrection in us will be accomplished in, in, in earth, on this earth, as, we, as it is in heaven. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.